I'm just putting the after the um, next week or so when we do the um, publish the webinar, it will be on the Citizen Network web website. So I just put the link in the chat there. Um, just a reminder for those of you who don't know, Citizen Network is a global cooperative. Over 190 organisations are members. That includes All Wales People First, I'm very proud to say, um, and also Lives Through Friends, both of whose representatives are here today. Um, and it's free to join, uh, as, and you can join as an individual or you can join as a group. Um, this year, the Citizen Network was um, registered as a co-op um, registered in Helsinki in Finland, which seemed like a good base. Um, a lot of the work is still done from the Centre for Welfare Reform, which I run uh, here in Sheffield. And uh, so I just wasn't quite padding, but I was just, just a little bit of talk to get us going. Um, so it's now two minutes past um, the half hour. Um, my name is Simon Duffy. I run the Centre for Welfare Reform and also lead Citizen Network. I'm delighted that we've got Bob and Joe here today to talk to us about life beyond services um, and the need for a completely different mindset, really, in the world of social care to the one that's dominated over the last 30, 40 years. Um, I've known Bob a fair while, I, I hesitate to guess exactly how long, both of us are a little bit grey um, now, um, but Bob has been uh, not only uh, a great friend, a great colleague, but he's been a real fighter for justice over the years. Uh, he was the founder of TACT, which was one of the major organisations in the early days of deinstitutionalization when big hospitals were being closed, uh, and over the last 10 years or so, he's been leading kind of grassroots work to break people out of uh, assessment and treatment units, to challenge the way that councils are working. He's also had time to author uh, several things. This is on, from my bookshelves behind me, uh, Much More to Life Than Services, and also the Green Book, Caring for Each Other sustain Sustainably. Um, so, We'll learn a lot from Bob, but also from Joe Powell. Joe's presentation is going to include a little bit of Joe's own life, so I'm looking forward to hearing more from that. But what I have read already is incredibly inspiring. Um, and he's leading All Wales People First, which is one of the most important self-advocacy uh, groups in the United Kingdom and, I'd say, in Europe. Um, it's been going for several years. It's powerful, well-organised, and is has a real impact in Wales. So um, it's fantastic that we've also got self-advocates and uh, family members coming together and organising and talking about um, the way forward. So I think I'm going to um, ask Joe to start. I have to, um, I think, I'm, Joe, I should ask you to unmute yourself. Right, I think you've done that brilliantly. And then you can start talking and share your screen. Thank you, guys. Well, yes, thank you very much. It's, it's you know, we're delighted that always people first uh, are a part of the Citizens Network. Uh, our National Council uh, voted who are the organization that, um, who run the organization, voted unanimously that we should be members. Um, and our presentation, sticking to the knitting, um, organizing for inclusion, not incarceration, more to life than services. So what's really, really interesting is, I think in my, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experiences. Um, Bob's gonna talk about some of the work he does. And we're gonna talk about some of the work we do together in terms of changing the way we think about um, how we support people, um, how we think about um, citizenship networks, which can make a big life difference to people with learning disabilities, autism, or whatever. I was told a joke once that I was told I should never tell 
in, a, in an environment like this because it would be highly inappropriate. So I told, don't tell it. But I am autistic. I don't, can't be expected to know any better, so it's all right for me to tell you the joke. And that is that the real triad of impairment in autism is health, education, and social services. Now, I've got to make this really, really clear before I offend anybody. It's not having to go with people who work in health. It's not having to go with people who work in education. It's not having to go with people who work in social services. It's just sometimes the systems we're involved in are the biggest barrier um, to well-being um, than the actual conditions or the, the things we're being supported with in the first place. And lots of people who work in these situations are also victims of a system which doesn't empower them to do what they ideally like to do either. So anyway, I'll move on. Uh, I'll hand over to, to you, Bob, I think for this, is that right? Yes, Joe. <laughs> Am I still muted? No, you, we can hear you. Okay, that's great. So, yeah, um, Joe's done some of my introduction, I think. Uh, essentially, what we're going to do today is to, to compare this experience, um, which is both um, ordinary and, extra and, and, and really extraordinary extraordinary with um with my observations about the system and our analysis about how the system as joe has already said um creates as many problems as it solves or probably more um as it's, it's for loads of people our social care system is a clear belt away from real life into it and we, we're all probably quite aware of how, how many people in England, for instance, more than 2000, um, are, are defined as patients in specialist hospitals. And that dis discounts the other people that are placed in, in specialist services for people who've acquired very challenging reputations, who maybe are not defined as being within a hospital setting. Um, the way I see it after about 40 years of working in this system or, or, or working in a system that's been evolved or changing, um, is that it's actually a self-fulfilling vicious circle. That's caused by loads and loads of things. Um, I don't think specialisation helps. I think the referral culture, um, the outsourcing and marketisation of, and, and commodified, uh, commodity of, of services has contributed to this as well. Increasing centralisation, whole notion of, uh, of economies of scale and standardisation, um, all seem to come together to um, to combine to create a, a real deficit mindset. Um, and you know, I, I get quite annoyed every time I hear people talking about placing people. Um, you know, yeah, my view is that we're in the business of enabling people to have a decent life. And um, we, you know, the moment we start placing people, we're in some way putting them in a container. Um, well, I notice, and this goes on, we, you know, we still work, uh, I'm, I'm over 70 now, but we're still working to get people out of some of those situations. And what we see over and over again is a lack of leadership, a lack of ownership. We, we can't really identify where, where decisions are being made. Um, we see systems that don't seem to believe in the capacity and capability of people um, to live differently and to have a different, or to even to have a vision about how that could be, uh, how it could be achieved. And um, there seems to be a, a widespread um, misunderstanding that the services are the most important thing, rather than recognising that services should actually support life, and real life um, is actually found in relation, is found in the real world. Um, and most of all, and we'll, we'll unpick this in a little bit through Joe's experience, um, we, we're just sort of so disappointed about the lack of purpose so often, um, lack of clarity of purpose and lack of um, clarity of principle. Um, so anyway, Joe is going to take us through. Could you pass on to the next screen, please, Joe? Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, this story, as I said, is extraordinary, but it's ordinary as well because of, I guess, the difference is that Joe is able, having come out of that system, um, to very, very um, competently tell us all about not just what happened, analyse what happened to him, 
and what kept him in a system for more than a decade. Um, and, you know, as I say, what we're, we're actually addressing is um, the system itself and the mindset that's associated with the system, which leaves people who've acquired a label as being decidedly defined as too hard and um, inevitable in a sense. You know, I think that quote out of the Bible of, you know, the poor are always with us, to, um, the people that I spend a lot of my time with. So, Joe, shall I pass it back to you um, in order to um, go from where you want to go? Yeah, absolutely. So, obviously, you see this picture of me graduating. I was looking like Harry Potter after he swallowed Hagrid. But it was lovely to have that opportunity. Um, and I think that brought it home to me when I went to that point about, you know, how many people, you know, get that opportunity to sit with peers of the same generation and not just other people with, with, with learning disabilities and, and autism that they're, that they're together. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of how I got where I was. This is a very early picture of me when I was really young and you know, the signs that I was on the autism spectrum were there, but it, it wasn't known. I mean, that was me in this photograph and that's the way I was. I was just withdrawn, you know, um, just not, not, um, not engaged at all. So I was born in 1976. Uh, I was in the 80s. I was behind my peers. It was during a time when being seen as different and not very intelligent was a real humiliation. Uh, it was really like the worst thing ever. And um, even my dad would threaten, you know, to send me to a specialist school if I didn't book my ideas up. Um, and, you know, that was the attitude at the time. It was shame. Um, I remember I had silly behavior to cover it up. I went to the opticians once and uh, the opticians came to the school, I beg your pardon. Dead quiet, didn't speak or, or, or say much. And um, she, she called me a silly sausage for a joke. And I went back and told the class, got a big laugh. And then I then, just from then on, I got a buzz out of making people laugh or trying to anyway. I'm not always funny. But um, yeah, and that silly behavior became my way of covering up my inadequacies. Um, you know, in, in, in class, I didn't understand the work or what, what the teacher was giving me. I would burst into tears, be bullied off the other kids. So I would just mess around and act silly like I didn't care. And it just became a way of covering it all up. By the time I went to the comprehensive school, I was suspended three times. For silly behavior, really, it, that's all it ever really was. Um, I saw a psychologist um, when I was 14 who suggested I was just a bit insecure. Why don't you change schools? So I changed schools. At 15, um, to one in Gateshead, I didn't know anybody. Um, I was quiet. I was hardworking. I was getting good feedback. And being the obsessive person I was, I became more and more obsessed with that image to the point of, um, of being nonverbal for the best part of 11 years. It became my recipe. It became my way of perfection of dealing with stuff. And I call it, um, I think I'm not diagnosed with it, but to me, I think it was post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a bit like a verbal anorexia. You know, anybody who knows me knows I've kicked the arse of real anorexia. There's no way I could ever be accused of that, um, besides me belly. But it was like a verbal anorexia. And every time I spoke, every time I made a joke, every time I was heard or my voice was heard, I needed excessive reassurance. Am I the quietest in the room? Could they hear me? And then I'd become even quieter to purge that. Um, obviously, I went on a, you know, I, I was on a Northumbria police youth training scheme for admin. <laughs> Eventually got a job because I spoke in the interview and I didn't speak hardly in the job. Obviously, I lost that job as a summons clerk. Then 1996, I was eventually diagnosed with this thing called Asperger syndrome, which I'd never heard of. Nobody had heard of it then. So you've got to remember what happened. Now, this on the left is the way I used to be. I'm pulling a Christmas cracker here, but I'm actually, that's the way I was. I was always like this, always shy, didn't talk, wrote down, you know, used to look through my fringe. Um, I was about 20 then. This was in Manchester. You remember, first and foremost, we had a long fight for a service. My parents felt incredibly guilty of all the trouble I'd been in and, and the, the times they told me off. Um, and they realized I actually had a situation. Their attitude and mine was, we'll get you into a care service, we'll fix them up. And then you'll come into the real world, you'll be brilliant. That's what we thought. That, that, that's how naive we were. I went to a service in Manchester. There were only three or four people there, really. The staff team weren't recruited. And um, we were promised stuff that wasn't delivered. It would be 
the word person-centered wasn't used then, but people would talk about how it would be tailored to your needs, how um, if you've got any difficulties, people would, would go to one side and speak to you. Um, but then what happened at one stage was an aggressive service user moved in. Um, he was getting more and more violent, attacking staff. I would get involved to then um, to protect the staff. I got into more trouble. Um, and in the end, then um, I had a lot of mental health issues because that then broke my perfect sense of perfection of me that had built up from the school, my only thing, because I was now getting aggressive. Um, the house manager, I didn't have any reviews from my care provider. My house manager just did it for me and she said, yeah, everything's fine. Um, my behavior was more and more challenging. The only way um, we could get any peace when this was going on was if I had an incident and the person that was causing the problems was attacked basically by me. When that happened, um, that quieted it down for a bit. The staff encouraged you to do it as well because that's the only way they could get some respite. Um, and it became more and more challenging. One member of staff who wasn't used to working with me spoke to me once in, in a dining room in our, uh, in our care home and he said, kill the monster, you're gonna to go to prison. If you go to prison, you'll get raped. Um, and I had a massive breakdown because again, that broke this perfect image. So I was in a major crisis. So I moved to a care service in Newport in South Wales because uh, my parents lived there. Basically their job had changed. We thought, let's have a new service, different provider. Let's go to this new care service in Newport. It's a much bigger story than this. It's hard to do with justice in what have you. So when I went to Newport, this is a very ironic photograph actually. When I went to Newport, because in the last service, I was so worried about being left behind and not being recognized as somebody with autism who needed support. I had to become obsessed with being the most effective person with autism. I had to be the most autistic, the most tallest, the most handsomest, the most modest, the most everything in the world. And that's what happened. I went to the new service and the adult service manager says, right, we're going to reverse the culture here. You're now going to be our most able service user. You're going to be the most able and that's what you're going to strive for. Okay then. So I did that. Staff didn't know my needs. Nobody really found out why I was there. Um, the routine and structure of the way the service run was very different. Same provider, very different part of the country. Both expert services did things so differently and so inconsistently. First service was a bit liberal too liberal when I needed the audits and challenging. Second service, I felt was, was a bit fascist. But I went to a routine, I uh, went to the day centre, got into some kind of routine, and I did well despite no real support. But the idea was I was going there for two years, then I would go out and live in the community. And I exceeded all expectations. I did really, really well. That meant really suffering on my own. I went from intense support at the last service, intense reassurance need, to going cold turkey overnight. And at one stage, I threatened suicide because I was in that much of a crisis, couldn't get to the day centre, what have you. And I heard the managers talking in the house, in the office next door to my flat because they were, they, were, they were joined. And I heard them say, making a contingency plan for if I committed suicide. It wasn't, how do we stop this? It was a case of, right, well, um, they were covering. They were covering themselves. And they were basically saying, Joe wrote that to shock. Um, and if he just commits suicide, this is what we'll do, X, Y, and Z. So I knew pretty much early on they weren't going to get me and why I was there. Their general feeling, even though I made all the progress, was, well, you're always going to need to be in care, Joe. You're never going to live in the real world. That, that just can't happen. There was a culture of staff bullying, which was even harder for me because I was so able that I blurred that boundary between staff and the person that used the service. Um, and when I raised the issues, people... They didn't believe me that such lovely people could do such, such these things. So I wasn't really believed. And I, 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 I suffered with the fallout from that. Things were so bad, I couldn't go to the day centre anymore because of that. So they suggested, well, why don't you go with Remploy and um, do some work experience? I went to Waste Savers, a Newport paint recycling plant, turned it around on my own. I mean, literally on my own over days. And I was offered a job straight away. Having autism or being on the autism spectrum wasn't a thing. You know, I just started to shine. Went to National Co Nash College in Newport to get an access course. So I could go on and do a degree. Um, very stressful. I used to sweat puddles and puddles of sweat all over the table because of the social anxiety. And people said, God, that was quite brave of you, Joe, despite that doing that. It wasn't bravery. It wasn't braveness. 
it would have been more it would have been more brave to have walked away um, than to have stayed because if I walked away, it would give my service every opportunity to say, Joe can't live in the real world. So it was immensely stressful. But then the teachers came to me and said, look, we want to put you forward for a special student award because not only are you doing well, you're helping the others through the course. So only, only in the autism specific expert care service was I seen as a person with autism who couldn't thrive. We're savers. I was a valued asset. In the Nash College, I was an outstanding student. Asperger's wasn't a thing. It didn't even exist in that environment as far as the general public was concerned. When Bob started to work with me, um, it was a complicated story really to, to cope with this, but long story short, I went to an advocate and said, look, this isn't fair. They're not letting me move on. I've told them it's time to move on. They won't listen. My advocate came. The problem my advocate has was she could help help me speak but she couldn't make them act they couldn't make she couldn't make them do anything so she went to my local authorities my social worker they just happened i think they were working with bob at the time in his organization life through friends they brought in bob and bob came in um to work on a good life plan and what you wanted for the future um when they heard bob was getting involved they told me that i would be sectioned within three months um if i went with bob um yeah, um, everything they did was about medical interventions. So instead of addressing the, the culture there, which I thought was of institutionalized bullying, they brought in counseling and psychology to fix me. It didn't occur to them that maybe it was the way I was treated by the staff or the fact they didn't know why I was there. That was the problem. It didn't even occur to them. It was difficult in being heard because the senior manager, the, the, the guy that run the overall thing, had a policy that if you had a problem, you go to the manager of that particular department. But that manager of that particular department didn't really understand me. So these issues were never resolved ever, ever, ever. Um, and of course, when Bob got involved, there was this whole, well, we're the autism experts. What does Bob know about autism? And what people didn't understand was this wasn't about my autism. This wasn't about understanding autism. This is about understanding that as a human being, I'm being treated like, pardon my French, well, I won't say because I promised I wouldn't swear. I was being treated like uh, not very nice. Um, so that was the issue. It was psychological and it was in the environment I was in. They were the problems. I remember the final meeting I had with Bob when I went into the care service uh, and we were talking about my way out. The overall general manager comes into the meeting 10 minutes late. He was there first as well. He was there before I was. He was the first one there, comes in 10 minutes late. Um, got defensive with Bob when Bob kind of asked him if he could just finish his point. And then he reacts in this kind of, well, I'm sorry, well, I'm sorry, defensive party way. And sitting there in that room, I'm starting to think, but that's how your staff treat me on a good day. And I'm told that that's normal, that's the real world. And I think the problem, the thing for me in care, what I've got to make really clear is their attitude was, well, if you can't cope with this service, you'll definitely not cope with the real world. So you're not ready to move on. It was the opposite. Things were so bad there that I had to go into the real world to get away from that. And the real world was far easier. But I didn't realize this at the time. The real reason I went with Bob, I didn't get what Bob was saying completely at the time. I saw the citizens not service users tag. I thought, great, I've been saying that kind of thing. But I didn't quite understand that people like me could live in the community and do an X, Y, and Z to the, to the level Bob did. The real reason I went to Bob was I was in a crisis. It was so bad I had to try something else. I learned this work once I started living it and once I started seeing it. That's how my eyes were opened. That's how it happened for me. Uh, yeah. So my, the road to now, in, in a nutshell, before it was like living in the, have you seen the TV program or the film, The Truman Show, where you live in, this guy called Truman's living in a reality TV show. Uh, but at some point as he gets older, he's thinking, well, this is a bit of a strange environment. How come at three o'clock every day, the postman passed a certain way? How come at four o'clock, the next door neighbor always revs his engine up at the same time? He starts to question. He starts to work out things aren't right. He breaks out of this reality TV set and he realizes he's been in a reality TV show. That's what it was like for me going into the real world. The stuff I was told that normal people don't do, that to be independent 
um, I couldn't be doing, making these certain mistakes. You start to realize that's not the truth. That's not the way it is. So when you leave care, although you think you've won in one way and you've got a triumph, you go through a massive bereavement process and a massive anger process as well, because you're starting to realize. I asked for my care files from Manchester and I was horrified with what was put in there. So remember I told you before about there was some incidents in there, um, kill the monster. What was basically recorded is why did Joe have incidents? Basically, Joe likes to intimidate people was what was put in there. What was not put in there was the fact that um, we were heavily managed by agency staff that didn't know us. 70%, that goes so far as to say. What wasn't put in there was the fact that we hadn't been out in days because one of the, the, the person talking about who was challenging was so challenging he needed all the support that he wasn't so funded for. I used to buy the staff flowers regularly, say thank you for what they've done for me. For me, and when we were short staffed, I would cook for the whole house to take the pressure off. That's not recorded. All that's recorded is this guy kicks off because he's a troublemaker. Anyway, when I was in Newport, my individual budget, which was £130,000 for a shared day service, hardly saw anybody in the care home, was reduced to £28,000. So that was a hundred, just over £100,000 less. And in that, I had my own counsellor, my own bookkeeper, a network facilitator to get me people in the community, two support workers. I'd never had so much support in all my life for the less for that money. Year after year after year, I was getting more independent. We were given 8,000, 9,000 back until eventually I didn't need it anymore. Um, there was a lot of talk to me to be a public speaker for raising awareness. Always people first wanted somebody who lived experience to head the organization. I applied for the job, got it. And because I've got the job, you get new opportunities for development. Because of that, people see you differently. I've just I bought a house. You can see my house there. It's not my car, but it's my house, big house. Um, never thought I'd ever get that. Um, funny about that house, because I remember... Um, the house manager of the house had said you'd be sectioned within three months, you, you know, you'll always need a service. The dentist is right next door to that house. I'm not kidding, I was only there six months. She walked out the dentist, saw me coming out the same time, and she double touched Joe. And I looked at her, I said, Oh, hiya. And she said, um, Who do you live there with? And I said, Oh, well, it's my house. She kind of looked. And then she was asking what I was doing. And I said, oh, I work for this organization called All Wheels People First. I didn't go into any real detail. And I don't know if it even registered with her. I've bumped into other staff in town and you're telling me you're working now. And I don't think it even registers. And she looks and she looked at my feet, pointed at my feet and said, you shoot it, the laces aren't done. So what occurred to me then is I could live, I could, people like that could live seven lifetimes and never get this. There's no point losing my temper. There was no point getting upset about it. I just, whatever. And I moved on. And I think that's one of the problems. When I did tell my story publicly as well, people try to get legal threats um, via a member of staff who, who works for us. Um, problem was I couldn't go to deal with it with them. It had to be done in their terms, in their way. You know, what they didn't understand was it wasn't just about Colonel Mustard in the drawing room with a candlestick. This was about a cultural problem, which they didn't get. Um, and the last thing I end with um, is that my progress is relative. Some people might turn around and say, well, not everybody could do what you do now. Yeah, but I think relatively they can. And I think if somebody like me who can communicate the way I can communicate can get lost in a system like this and not be seen to be able to do anything, it calls two things into question. How specialist are these so-called specialist services? And number two, is it any wonder people were learning disabilities with more complex needs and communication needs? Is it any wonder we miss them when they're abused or physically assaulted or what have you? And the problem with my system in care is because there was no physical abuse, there was no money stolen, there's no sexual abuse. My experience was all right and non-abusive, but it is. Anyway, sorry, I rattled on there. I'm going to move on to Bob. Hi, Joe, have you finished? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right, you broke up, so I didn't. I missed the, the last oh, apologies. sentence. Okay, no problem. Just, just to sort of wind this down and put it into a, a systems um, and, and a practice. Um, when I started 
he, he didn't say this, but it took quite a long time to, to get to grips with where Joe wanted his life to go. Um, what we'd learned um, over the years with tax and subsequently had been um, partly with the plan organisation. Um, Alan Vicky had sort of challenged us to ask different questions and um, different questions which were around how do you want your life to be? What's for you? What really matters to you? Instead of asking people what, what support and what services they require. Um, when I asked those questions and um, on, the, on numerous occasions we'd been, um, in various cafes and pubs, um, we eventually somewhere and the, the turning point for Joe was the point, at, well, for me it was, Lee, it wasn't, I think it was for Joe, um, was the point at which Joe sort of screams at was to pay tax. We're into how do you create um, an environment, how do you create support, how do you create opportunity um, to enable Joe to, um, to pay tax, as he is now, um, quite significantly, as the leader of an organisation. Um, and I think that's a really big message because of, we, we use this, and as I'll go through the framework in a moment, every, it is about asking not, um, you know, reinforce this over and over again. We're not asking about needs. We're asking about where you want to be. And the challenge for us as professionals is be. Next screen, please, Joe. Hi, Joe. Can you move the screen on, please? Thanks, mate. Sorry. The second thing we'd learned from our, you know, our, our interaction with John McKnight and in, uh, in the um, asset-based um, community development movements um, have been that actually when you're talking about care, there are two arenas for care. Unfortunately, the way in which we've developed it in the UK and much of the um, of, um, commodified world is um, that we only attend to one half of it. Um, what we attend to is the stuff that services do. Um, the stuff we don't attend to is the stuff that um, is natural. The stuff that um, people love and care for each other because of people have belonging because or where they do have belonging or because of we've created opportunities for social capital to exist. Um, so, um, uh, the second thing that we learned was that competent professional work in both environments. We can work in the environment of relationship and we can work in the contractual relationships that are established um, between institutions and clients. Um, I almost destroyed that by taking away. Your signal must be very bad, Bob, I think. Um. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we seem to have we seem to have lost Bob a wee bit. Uh, Joe, could you um, take down the screen for a second? Let's see if we've physically got Bob on camera. Yeah. Are you there, Bob? <laughs> um, can you get on? Let's un undo screen up screen. Oh, we'll just I'm just taking this off. So, right, is Bob there at all? That's <laughs> no, he, he he seems to have disappeared altogether. So I think that's Bob's. So maybe Bob will come back. Joe, do you want to just if if we're we're waiting for Bob to kind of sign in again? I'll see if he's. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit um, about what you 
think some of the lessons are that maybe Bob would be talking about now. Is that all right? Absolutely. I, I think essentially, again, as I was saying at the beginning, I think we, we, we sometimes make the mistake that the only thing a person needs in their life is a support service and um, that people need protecting. Um, we forget that people need real lives, they need to live in communities. Um, I see it with members now. We have members now who are in their care service who are still often thinking in terms of that medical um, that medical way of thinking. You always need to live in a service. And it's like nothing has changed out of all that time. Also, opportunities breed opportunities. And one of the problems I had with the system I was in was um, it was with the benefit system and everything. Um, you couldn't get the opportunities unless you could prove you were innocent, that you were completely competent uh, and 100%. Um, and if you couldn't do that, then you didn't get the opportunity in the first place. And that isn't the reality for most people. So we have a system that's and constantly dependent. Um, and when they're dependent, they're not going to move on. They're not going to have aspirations. Um, they're going to be trapped in the system and the situation they're in. So what I'm not saying is personally is care services are bad and we need to get rid of them. I think they need to be reformed. Don't get me wrong. I think they ought to be better. For some people that might be a thing and that be, might be all right. But many other people just want real lives. They want to live in the community. They want friendships. They want opportunities like other people. Uh, they want to be contributing members of society and the real life reciprocal human um, benefits of that for both people. I think in a nutshell for me, that's how I would phrase this. Um, Bob could probably do it a lot more eloquently. I think that was pretty eloquent. Um, so maybe we, I don't know whether what's going to happen. Uh, there's a suggestion if we turn our video off, but I think it's actually Bob's internet that's the problem because um, his, his sound was already poor. So sitting in his garden shed, I think that the <laughs> signal wasn't maybe the best. But Joe, you're here, I'm here, everybody else is here. And I think this is an opportunity for a really important conversation. So um, I wonder whether anybody just would like to ask you a question or just throw out a, an opinion really on what, what they think would be a, a better way forward given the problems that you've very eloquently and clearly described. Um, if you, you can put an H in the chat, which means you want to speak, or if your camera's on, you can wave at me um, or, um, yeah. Has anybody got a question for, for Joe just to begin the, begin the discussion? I'm looking at everybody's faces whose faces are here and I'm looking at the chat bar. Um, what is, let me ask you a question, Joe, as the chief executive of All Wales People First, what is the role of self-advocates at this point? Um, you know, we've gone through various phases, haven't we? And self-advocacy has, has become more important. And in Wales, it's become well-established. But at the same time, doesn't feel like we're making massive breakthroughs with the system, does it? So what do you think is the role of the self-advocacy movement? And what could we all do to make that stronger? I think one of the big problems as well is, in, and I can talk about the Welsh context here, is a lot of people get mixed up with self-advocacy and advocacy. And, you know, in Wales, there's a big, there's a big lean on this thing we call preventative services. So stopping things happening, obviously, before they get out of control. And to me, self-advocacy is the ultimate preventative service. If a person at the point of contact can say, I have an issue, we can deal with it much sooner. Now, advocates are brilliant. We need advocates. And I'm not saying without an advocate, I might still be in care now. Without Bob, I might still be in care now. So they're very important. But if you imagine you take a solicitor, every time you're going to take back a pair of shoes, when you can actually speak for yourself, you know, you need advocates for the big things. You do the everyday things, but also when you can speak for yourself or you speak up for yourself, you are empowered. But what it also does is forces the other person to look you in the eyes, see you as an individual. That's how you change attitudes. You change attitudes by being visible and present in society. So if somebody say, I've heard in pub, for inst pubs, for instance, people make derogatory uh, remarks about people with Down syndrome, for instance. To me, it an important part of, of self-advocacy is that person with a person with down syndrome being visible in that pub every friday having a pint doing nothing more than that just being seen and then people can start to think well actually this isn't necessarily the stereotype that i've been led to believe um one of the big problems still is that some people still 
don't think that people with learning disabilities um, can speak for themselves, that they need others to speak for them. We have a situation in Wales, like in England, self advocacy is getting a real pace thing. In Wales, we're a bit luckier, but it's still under threat because we have this thing called independent professional advocacy, uh, independent professional advocacy contracts, which are placed in emphasis on formal one-to-one -one advocacy and on self-advocacy. So we're in a position in Wales where we could lose self-advocacy, which would take us to a time, I believe, before um, the All Wales strategy of 1983, which was a major, major significant turning point in, in Welsh policy. Karen has a question as well. So I'm trying to find... Thanks. Oh, thank you, Karen. Thanks, Simon. Um, thanks, Joe, and hopefully Bob when he's back. Um, my question is around the group's experience of helping to shift the language and the approach and the and the way that you articulate your services and your organisations and the support networks that you offer and how you do what you do for people who do have needs that sit on a spectrum or, you know, using the old language, if you like, of, you know, supported needs or disabled or whatever, but, but what are some specific ways and um, difficulties that you've overcome in shifting that language and trying to move your approaches and your organizations into a far more inclusive human, we're all suffering from the same stuff after all, guys, that you know those really fundamental changes has anyone had some successes has anyone had some horrible failures um because you can learn lots from that that's the kind of i'd be really interested in anyone's experiences of that please thank you thanks for the opportunity hello joe i'm back um back back on a different machine um my office has completely lost wi-fi i'm somewhere in the house um can you hear me you yeah. can, yes, we can, Bob. Yeah. No, right. now I'll put you, uh, your face is now gi ginormous on the screen. <laughs> um, so I, I, I guess, I, I, I suppose you never got to um, the, the, my last screen where, when I lost, um, lost Wi-Fi. Um, I think the answer to that might be if I could run through that for Karen. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, why that would be amazing. Thank you, Bob. So, Joe, can you can you get that screen up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is what we've been um, working on for the last twenty years, I guess, and it keeps evolving. But uh, you know, when I started talking earlier, I was saying there are. Yeah, you know, I was going to say there are three three key things in practice we do um, that we encourage everybody else to do. And every time people ask us to help, um, th this is where we start. Um, one is the, the, the asking what really matters question. The, the second one is recognizing that we are complementary and supplementary as professionals to the real world. And that our job is to supplement that, not to replace it. And the third one is about um, developing ourselves as effective problem solvers. Um, we do a hell of a lot of creative thinking and problem solving training um, when we're setting up teams and when we're working with organizations. And we do that at chief executive level in public authorities as much as we will do it with um, support staff on, on the ground in services and often with self-advocates. Um, but just running through you know, our, our current, and it, it evolves every year, every, every, all the time we keep learning. Um, our starting point is, uh, as I say, to find out what really matters. And that's, 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 the, that's absolutely fundamental things, not to, not to come up with lists of needs and therapies, but to actually find out where we're trying to go and then to, to work in that context. Secondly, um, by encouraging people, and, and we will always insist that our job is to be supplementary and complementary to the core of the relational economy. And our job is always to help people help themselves. When we were supporting Joe um, to rebuild his life, Joe will tell you, um, we did very little for him. We just um, helped him think through what he needed to do for himself. You can't obviously do that for everybody, but um, we do it with a surprising number of people. Um, and very often in order to take life forward for people, particularly people who've been isolated and institutionalized for a long time, we have to build a relational economy. We have to, we, we, we've taken the Plan Lifetimes Advocacy Network process 
and applied this in our in our casework in our in our supportive brokerage if you like um, so very often when when you find out what really matters to people and you find out that relationships always matter um, and you find there are hardly any and sometimes none then the first thing to do is to actually create those things and that that's not something a social worker can do if they're not working in a locality and they're not given the scope to work in that locality and to actually work with the community around them. Um, next, we nurture, as I've said, effective and creative thinking, um, and we we continue to do that. We're, we're you know central to our approach is how many ways can we think of of addressing this particular objective? How many ways? How many how can how many possibilities can we create, not just take, um, in order to pursue the road, road, the road that we're taking. And that very often means, um, and nearly always means, that we need to, um, to keep um, resources very, very flexible. Uh, again, um, you know, we, we would look at ISFs and um, at personal budgets as the core way of, of actually funding the activity that we're involved with. Um, and part of that is not just about taking, it's about supporting everybody to contribute to and as well as receive from their communities and build their communities. Um, most of the work we do is with people who've acquired very challenging reputations and um, we work with, with really great organisations like Studio 3 to um, take the stress out of behavioural management. You know, we, we'll only work with behavioural um, experts who recognise that the work is about enabling somebody to have a life, not just about managing some behaviour. Um, and it's astounding how much um, statutory work seems to be focused on um, the reduction of you know, the incidence and the intensity and the duration and so on of behaviours rather than um, looking at that in the context of the life that somebody wants to live. Um, we, we've always taken the view, um, I've been around a long time, that our work isn't, um, is, isn't episodic. Um, we're working with somebody on a journey. Um, essentially, we don't review them, they review us. You know, it's our relevance to them that's the importance. And whilst funding is really, really important, um, it's not the only thing that's important. And our experience is, as Joe was explaining earlier, that by taking the approach that we take, and this is a, unfortunately a major selling point to lots of the people that engage with us, um, you know, by taking this approach, by building real lives with people, um, we actually diminish in many, many cases dependency on, on, on funded services. And for ourselves, it's about leadership. But it's not about leadership getting out there and telling people what to do. It is about inclusive leadership. It's about um, involved leadership. It's about showing. It's about demonstrating. It's about being there. And finally, it's about um, embracing what um, has been described as cold heaven. It's this notion. It's why we chose the, the, the title of sticking to the knitting. Um, it's this notion that we have to... Um, basically be tenacity, show tenacity and stick with things through the hard times and not lose um, our sense of purpose and principle um, whilst we're having to redesign in order to pursue those purposes. And so that's as quick as I could run through that. Well done, Bob. Is there anything else you want to say in the form of presentation and should we just go back to a discussion now? Oh, let's go back to the questions. I think people have heard enough. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, so let's see. So that was a great question from Karen to help us in there. And I think Bex, um, do you want to talk a little bit? I'm just going to pick on you. <laughs> I know you, you can cope. I can. Yes. Is there something in particular you'd like me to speak about? Well, you were talking a little bit about the professional yeah. In the real world context of living up yeah. to the values and different thinking. Yeah, so, yeah. So what were you thinking and, and maybe then Bob and Yeah, I, I was thinking very much from my learning and my learning from being quite a young child um, and always trying to view people, everyone around me as, as my equals. And that was further enhanced when I worked with neighbourhood networks um, as, uh, as, as part of the networks in Argyll and Butte around the fact that we're all citizens, we're all people, and we all have our own unique 
differences and the things that connect us. And if we can all get to that position rather than viewing ourselves as professionals and people who need support as if, as if that's two separate entities, then you know, if we can get to that point where we do view each other as, as equal human beings, then I think it moves us into a very different place of working together. Um, and certainly that's something that, that I try to do. And I spend a lot of time going back to the people that I'm working alongside who have come to me looking for some support um, to check in that that's what's happening and for them to let me know if ever I overstep the mark. So it is very much about I'm here to be alongside you in the way that makes the most sense for you. And I think, you know, that, that for me, that's the, the best that I can do at the moment with the resources that I have. So maybe, Joe, would you like to talk to, in a sense, what, what, you're, what you want from professionals, from your experience? Yeah, it's like when I said that, that bad joke before about the, um, the trial of impairments, how to use social services. I, I just goes back to that idea that absolutely people want to do the very best and, and people, are, but the system sometimes ties them up in knots as well. But I think what I would like is, is generally people to know why you're there what the reason you're there and understand why you're there. Also, this whole thing as well was really important. In my time in care, I never, I wasn't bothered that people didn't get me here or get me there because I appreciated that it was more difficult to do that, that at that time with what they understood. It was the fact you weren't included and you weren't part of something. So I think just for me, it's having to understand what your needs actually are and know who you are and what you need um but also just to be honest and open and if somebody can't deliver something it's not a crime people can say look joe we appreciate you're ready to move on but actually we don't quite know what to do about this yet um we're struggling how do you want to take this forward and now we're allies so instead of having this situation where people like me are saying oh well i was denied x y and z we turn that narrative to we're now allies. We're both perplexed by this. We're friends challenging a common problem. And I think to me, that's the key. And it's honesty because nobody could be God. Nobody could just make things wonderful. And we can't expect anybody to do that. And let's just have that honesty and mutual respect. That's a brilliant answer, Joe. Thank you. Well, Bob, I was wondering from you, like you've, you've operated at different levels and you engage with mm -hmm. people at but supposedly responsible for systems, although that's often a kind of, um, uh, yeah, that's an exaggeration of the power that people really have. But what's your sense of then what we can do to, I suppose, challenge the craziness of some of the systems that, that mean that support workers are often working in this kind of completely dysfunctional, unhelpful way and, and that our systems are not designed to really liberate people and help people get things that matter to them? What? Where do we begin those kind of battles, maybe? I don't know. We seem to have been having them for a very long time, Simon. It's the, um, how, do, how do you put it? Um, I've come to the conclusion that all you, you know, uh, it's a bit like Bex was saying, all you can do is, is carry on demonstrating and be what you can be. Um, we at Lies Through Friends are in, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in the, the twilights of our careers and we're in the position an, an unusual position to say to the system if you want to work with us then we, we don't do it on your terms um, and you know that's fine um, things you know where where we get engaged to do things things get done um, we have the opportunity of sharing the sort of stuff we've been sharing this afternoon we have the pro opportunity to demonstrate it but my experience is it doesn't generally um, change um, change the systems in which people are working um, things change for specific people and for specific groups of people as long as the the um, champions within those service settings um, hang around but very often they're the people that get promoted or the people who uh, as with the case with somebody we've been working with very recently basically throw in the towel and say I'm going off to do something else um, because of I you know it's just so hopeless within this system um, you know, my my commitment in, in terms of what the centre does is um, because of the centre is one of those um, fora in which we can have policy discussions um, and maybe occasionally um, be able to have conversations with people that might actually listen and, and take things in a different direction. But yeah, it's very, very clear that there's a... Um, 
uh, uh, it's it's almost definitely the case that actually applying market rules is more important than meeting people's needs in the way in which both central government and its and its civil service institutions and local authorities um, um, perceive the world. Actually, it's there, there is more to be lost in 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 um, not keeping to those rules and, and and offending those rules than there is in actually doing damage to people, and that's really really sad. Yes, I think one of the um sad things we find i mean the sense of works as a think tank and engages with politicians and civil servants to some degree um mm. but you get a strong sense that actually there's a lot of de facto corruption in the system um mm. politicians who have got commercial interests inside uh, the care sector and who are not really interested in what difference these things make to people's lives um, but in that context, Karen asked just a straightforward question, but a good one well, in Wales that, you know, the polit political situation is perhaps not as dire as it is in England. The question was, do you think the new legislation in Wales, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, will help bring about positive change? I mean, Joe and Bob probably have a view on that. Joe, maybe, would you like to say something and then Bob? I think in principle, absolutely. And I was so excited when I saw the legislation coming out. In practice, no. In practice, I don't think anything's changed. Um, the problem with the social services well-being in Wales, I, I feel it's largely aspirational, and it's down to a lot of local authorities' um, interpretation of that. And the problem we have is when we go to Welsh Government, we say, look, this is not working in a region. They say, well, go to that region. It, you know, it's their authority. You challenge them and tell them it's in the Act. They'll turn around and say to us, well, go to the Welsh Government telling them to give us some more money. And the Welsh government will turn around and say, we give them plenty of money. And so in practice, I feel we've got legislation that is brilliant in principle, but any legislation that can't be used is, is useless. Bob? Yeah, I, I'd reinforce what Joe is saying. I, I think um, there's a hell of a lot of difference between policy and practice still. Um, and... You know, it's astounding how often people um, tell me how wonderful things are in a particular place and then we get asked to go and work there and um, it's no different to anywhere else really. Um, there, there are exceptions to rules but uh, for me the fundamental issue is, recognize, you know, is this fundamental um, recognition that services are not there to take over people's lives and that it's not down you know I, we used I, I was a county councillor in the 1980s for quite a long time and we used to have things called yellow perils um, we call them yellow perils they were they were um, requests and complaints and things that came through the system um, to councillors and I was very aware in those days um, that um, you know, politicians perceive their role as being seen as sorting things out for people rather than doing things with people. I think that's become extended to services as well. We don't do stuff with people anymore. We do it for people. They are our customers, um, using the language that you hear so often in English local authorities, um, instead of um, uh, citizens who we are supporting to to live their lives. I seem to remember when I was first teaching social workers back in the 1980s that um, the terminology that was used um, to define what a social worker was, was it was somebody who enabled somebody to um, improve their, uh, their, their life situation in the context of their family, their friends and their community. Um, I think now if you were to look for a definition, it would be um, somebody that ass assists somebody to get um, access to service if they're eligible. There's a really lovely question in the chat from Andrea. Um, I don't know, I, Andrea, would you be willing to just talk to it a little bit? Um... Hi, Joe. Um, yeah, my question was, um, I, I work alongside Joe um, from, I'm from Cardiff University. But I'm also a parent of a of a ten year old girl um, who's autistic, and how do I kind of help her to self advocate for herself at ten years old? Because I think it's really important to that self advocacy starts from very young, 
Um, and also, how do I help her recognise what is a good or bad service for her? Thank you. Uh, so you want me to answer, answer that, Simon? Yes, Joe. Brilliant. Right. Thank you. So I didn't want to assume. Hi, Andrea. Uh, Hi. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's an interesting thing. I think for me, it always comes down to that human rights element as well. And self-advocacy is essentially starting as a human rights movement. And it's about knowing what your rights are in the first place. I think that's the bottom line, which I'm sure as a parent you can do. Um, self-advocacy groups. This is not just a plug for first. You know, you don't have to go to a self-advocacy group. But they're a place where some of our members are told what what about the UN Convention and what they're, what they're entitled to, what they could expect, the treatment they should have. Um, I'm just going to look at your question again to make sure I cover it. Um, and in terms of a good or a bad service, I only think part of that is about being aware of the menu of options that is out there as well. When I was in the care service, you see, I would be sceptical people about the stuff Bob did. Because um, although part of me thought, well, I'm a citizen, I should live in the real world, Please pardon the expression, but I would have probably thought in those days about, well, that's right, you can't in the asylum. I would have been as guilty of that thinking as anybody else because I didn't know any different. As I said before, it was only until I came out into the real world and experienced it, I started to, to know what Bob was talking about. And I had to in crisis. So I just think plenty of real life experience. Um, I think knowing, knowing rights, knowing what you're entitled to. I think the great thing for your daughter, which is young and what we notice about self-advocacy we're coming through now they're so different to the elderly ones the more older ones still a little bit more cautious maybe still need permission but we find that the younger ones are that little bit more bolshy and that little bit more fire in their belly we believe that that's the legacy of some self-advocacy so i think that's the great thing you've got andrea is with a daughter who's young enough to, you know to learn this stuff now uh, right <laughs> Um, so I'm gonna. So we're just a bit over time, but there was a great question from Rick as well. Oh, no. I'm gonna ask Rick to ask it. I'm gonna kind of maybe just ask Joe and Bob both to end with. Um, so I'm gonna ask Bob then Joe to maybe think about what are the new developments, the the things that you're seeing out there in the real world that that actually do make you optimistic, building on, I mean, self-advocacy is one of them. I remember when self-advocacy was brand new, I'm old enough to remember, and how hard it was to support those original groups and get the funding for them. And we're in a, we are in a better position on that front. So what are the kind of threads or practical things that in the next few years we need to get behind and support that are gonna m help us move on this journey to full citizenship and to push back on this weird and broken culture that's taken over social care. So Bob first, then Joe, and then we'll bring things to an end. Okay, Simon, I, I just wanted to say to, um, I've forgotten her name, but the lady who spoke last, um, that um, I'm also the parent of, of now a 35 year old young woman who um, is on the spectrum as well. Um, I think parents have a have a crucial role to play um, in enabling um, people on the spectrum to live an ordinary life and um, and that's partly because uh, um, with help with help from people that understand how to um, enable people who are anxious to um, you know anxiety and stress are at the center of most most um, people's lives on the spectrum um, to actually have time to to, to think through rather than be given instructions uh, as, as they develop a, a capacity to represent themselves in the world. Just, you know, to, to share the good news, my, my, my daughter um, lives independently. She lives with her partner. She's worked since she left school. Um, we've had friends um, who've, who've helped us cope with a system that would not have left her in that position. Um, but to this day, um, we, we have day, almost daily conversations which support that, that, that focus on the telephone and, and on Zoom and so on with her. Um, as far as Simon's final question is concerned, um, I think it's just about building more and more of us that recognise that relationship and, um, and, and supporting people to have life um, is at the centre of things and supporting people that are prepared to work with people and families and individuals um, who are prepared to actually take on the challenge. I think um, extending um, 
access to um, personal budgets and um, that, that sort of agenda is, is really important. Um, and in, in my day-to-day -day experience at the moment, one of the real opportunities is the degree of embarrassment that there is in England in particular about the number of people that continue to um, exist rather than live um, as patients in, in specialised hospital settings, particularly people um, who've acquired uh, allegedly complex challenging behaviours or forensic um, labels. Um, we, we're doing some and have been doing for the last 30 years really successful things in, in demonstrating that those people a don't need to live in that way and um, uh, don't need to cost society so much and can be contributors. In, off, in fact, often contri contributing more than people who are not deemed to have those challenges um, because of the way in which we work. And I think the more people that can get to grips with um, addressing um, the opportunity because of that embarrassment and the fact that there are targets um, to reduce the numbers of people living in those institutional settings is, is a real opportunity that we should, we should um, take seriously. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Joe, what, 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 what makes you more optimistic? Beyond self-advocacy, what do you think are the strategies we should be getting behind practically in our communities now? I think as, as much as I was negative about certain legislation before, I guess at least it's on people's tongues now, at least it's in people's mindsets a bit more than it was. Okay, it's got a long, long way to go. That gives me a bit of a bit of op op optimism. Um, optimism. Obviously, I'm a big fan of individual budgets because of the massive difference it made to my life. I think if we can roll that out more, and, uh, direct payments in Wales are the kind of individual budget that Bob envisaged with me. It, it's changed a lot and in my opinion, I don't know about Bob's, but it's been kind of bastardised to what it was actually meant to be to begin with. Um, you know, the fact that we've had the calling cluster, must not perfect, but the kind of move forward to independence. This thing about co-production as well, the fact that people are starting to do this or think about this stuff. All right, I, I don't know whether it's always done the way it ought to be done. I just think there are things happening. There are slow leaders and slow gears. Um, whether they happen with the auto um, yet, probably not, but I just think that, I think the fact that it's, we often, sorry to rattle up, but I think the one thing we do have an opportunity for is, because society, this, when Bob and I were talking about all this stuff years ago, this was before the financial crisis and all this, and I think we were arguing then that it wasn't sustainable, it wasn't, you know, to use money the way we were using, both and of course morally for people with autism and learning disabilities. I think the fact now that we're in an economic situation, we, the, what gives us hope is we're now being forced to rethink about the way we do things. The only criticism I make of that is it shouldn't be driven by economics, it should be driven by what we do, but I'm hoping we could also, although we're living in tough times, there could be the potential to be the best ever times because actually we're, in a, we're now recognising society we can't do things the way we've always done them brilliant thank you joe thank you bob thank you there's also some really good stuff in the chat if people just want to have a look at that some thank yous glenn nice comment there from glenn and others uh, so look at that before we close the session i suppose just to finish um i would like to again just draw your attention to one of the strange opportunities of this crisis is that we're learning how to use uh, internet technology although obviously that's also fraught with problems like poor reception uh, again I'll restrain myself from commenting on the need for uh, free global broadband provided by a Labour government sadly that didn't happen did it? Um, but I think one of the seriously one of the things we've been trying to do through the Centre for Welfare Reform now for 10 years is to make public policy a citizen's business, to provide information free so that citizens can start to empower themselves with knowledge about what, um, what we do need to make the world a better place. And to stop this assumption that somehow politicians are merely just going to do that for us because we vote for them every five years. We've got to start educating ourselves, I believe, and start demanding better but also working together to achieve better outcomes for ourselves as a community. And that's also why we did create sort of a network, because one of the exciting things about this moment 
for all of the challenges is there's a world of people out there who want to see a better world, who don't want to be living in a kind of constant growing climate crisis, who don't want to accept growing inequality and economic insecurity, and who want to treat each other with respect, not despite our differences, but precisely because human beings are wonderfully different. Autism and learning disabilities are just part of the wonderful diversity of human beings and it's welcoming that diversity and, and acknowledging and affirming our equality with that diversity that enables us to be true citizens. So I'd really like to thank Joe and Bob again. I think they've demonstrated those principles in the real world. Um, hats off to Joe for all he's achieved, but also for all Wales people first for demonstrating the leadership that they have as an organisation. And hats off to Bob, who over the years has just, uh, I, th I think the, uh, I could sense Bob a slight sense of frustration there with the world and with your internet, but uh, that, you know, what you've achieved uh, is um, fantastic. And um, we look forward to continuing to work together with you um, to build on this learning and getting it out there a bit more so thanks everybody enjoy the weekend so this will be up probably next week on the citizen network website but check out the webinar page to uh, look at this and we'll also put the slides up there um thank you all bye for now thank you